All right, take your Bible. Let's turn to John 11. John 11. I told you some time ago we want to do about the resurrection. A lot of times all you hear about a message about resurrection is on Easter Sunday. But we will be going into different passages in these weeks here. And tonight, from death to life, we look at John 11, basically 1 through 14. Let's stand together, would we, as I share the reading of this scripture. You can follow along there. John 11. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Martha which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Master, The Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well. Howbeit, Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. May God bless his word. You may be seated. From death to life. Let's suppose you were in the cemetery at Monte Vista right now. We were there. Paul Barris brought the casket to the gravesite. There may be 50 people standing around, and Pastor Don says, John, in the name of Of the Lord Jesus, arise. And the casket opened. He raised up and got out. Now, what's going to happen to the 50? And what's going to happen to the pastor also? It'd be a lot of fainting and falling and fleeing, I guess. But we'd say, really, there's a miracle taking place, wouldn't it? The greatest miracle. In Jesus' earthly ministry was when he raised others. Lazarus had been dead in the grave four days. And that miracle could not be denied and avoided by the Jewish leaders. If Jesus could do nothing about death, then whatever else he could do amounted to nothing. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most pitiable, that is miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Death is man's last enemy, 1 Corinthians 15 and 26. Jesus has defeated the horrible enemy totally, permanently. So, in John 11 here, we have some purposes for Lazarus' death. The basic message here is that Lazarus' death gives Jesus opportunity to reveal himself as a resurrection in the life. We'll see that in another message, John eleven twenty five 25 and following. 
And each purpose we talk about is applicable to the death of the believer in Jesus. Purpose number one, to glorify God and proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. That was what the death of Lazarus. First of all, glorify God and proclaim Jesus as Son of God. See in verses 1 through 4. Now, dear man, the dear man Lazarus, he said he's sick. He's from the town of Bethany, the town of Mary and Martha, because they're, they're the sisters to Lazarus. Some say it's a suburb about two miles from Jerusalem. The family op- opened their home often to Jesus when he came. And Lazarus had these two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they sent news to Jesus, Brother Lazarus, is dead. He's very sick. He's about to die. And he says, this sickness is not for death. He will die for the glory of God and his son Jesus. Might die that the works of God can be demonstrated. God desires honor and he wants our lives changed from unbelief to belief, darkness to light, death to life. There's got to be a wake-up call to all who were there and who would be there when he comes to the town of Bethany. The question is, what's most important for us as Christians in this life? Is it to be healthy or holy? Wealthy or wise, prideful or humble, to receive it all or be willing to give it all down for the Lord. Jesus said to glorify God in all that we do. That's the main point about the death that would take place with Lazarus. Have you examined your life in ministry in the past week, past month, three months, six months, or year? In raising Jesus, Lazarus from the dead, both the Father and the Son would be glorified as the life of the world. Now Jesus said in John 5, 22 and 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And he that honors not the Son honors not the Father. So Jesus is speaking about he and the Father are one. So the purpose number one for the death of Lazarus is to glorify God and his Son Jesus as the Son of God. Second purpose. The death of Lazarus was to show Jesus great love. Look at verse 5. Now Jesus blanked Martha and her sister and Lazarus. What's the word? Loved. Great love. He loved each member of the family. Jesus' love is personal, individual. Aren't you thankful for that? We picture as a whole world, Jesus came to die for the world. But most importantly, he came to die for those who are his. His. To know him. Called of him. By grace through faith. Repentance of sin and grace through faith in Jesus. The story with the family is like your story and my story. Each one of us has needs. Right now, in this church, somebody has a need. I'd say every one of us has a need. Lazarus was sick and dying. Sisters grieving, confused, brokenhearted. Jesus hadn't come. Days are passing. 
Lazarus' death gave him the opportunity to demonstrate his great love, especially for each one of them. You can be here this hour and say, well, I just don't think Jesus cares for me. He, I don't think he loves me. Well, just look back a chapter. This is one of the great cha- chapters of the Gospel of John 10. John 10. I call it the Good Shepherd chapter. You, you've read that before. Look at verse 3. Talk about the personal love. To him the porter opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. They hear his voice. They know his name. He calls them by name. He goes before them, verse 4, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. When he comes through the door, it says here, everybody who comes through the door, verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me were thieves and robbers. The sheep didn't hear the voice. I am the door, verse 9. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 11, he gives life for his sheep. He sacrifices. He dies for us. Now, if you can't grasp the great love of Jesus, that is a key to knowing Jesus. Do we belong to Jesus? Well, he loved Lazarus. And he's going to let the girls know about that later on. They would see it, be a part of it. Many people would. Purpose number three, the death of Lazarus. We need to wait upon God in great crisis. Verse 6. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He stayed in that same town. It seems that Lazarus was already dead. We know this because Lazarus had been dead buried four days when he arrived in verse 17 later in verse 39 it talks about. See, the first day was travel for the messengers to get the word to Jesus. The second, third day, that's two days for Jesus to complete his ministry. And so the fourth day, Jesus needed to travel to Bethany, so that took about a day. So therefore, he got to four days. We're on a schedule, aren't we? What are you going to do in the morning? You don't, you don't have a great plan to do it. It's already planned. Some of the, those at the workplace, it's already planned. It's time to get up and go to work. Somebody go to a meeting you got to plan for supper. you got to plan for shift changes. We're time-constrained, but not Jesus. Our Lord Jesus was and is on divine time. Look at verse 9. Jesus said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he sees the light of this world. He's waiting on the Father to tell him about getting down to Bethany to show and glorify the Father and His Son Himself. Martha and Mary had to learn to wait upon the Lord. You have a hard time waiting, don't you? Let me tell you a beautiful story. Here's the other day. uh, My daughter said, could you help with little jewels? I said, Oh, sure, I can work it out. We'll work out a plan. Well, she couldn't go to school because it had the strangest things. You have to wait 24 hours. If you get a little sick, she got sick on her stomach like 9 or 10 o'clock. So she had to go pick her up, take her home. Well, she was well an hour or two at home. Now, comes the next morning, you can't go to school because it's not 24 hours. That's just... 
That's the way it is. Anyway, she comes over and I said, "Uh uh-oh, I know she's already upset. She's already sad. She said, now, Papa, I suppose to do the, this is her schedule now. Watch, watch her schedule. But it ain't right. It's not right. She, she did a little bit of it. But see, she changed it. See, you don't tell me they don't know. She's seven years old and she's, she's smarter than I was when I was 12 or 13, I'm sure. Anyway, that's the way it is. Um, she said, now, Papa, I suppose to do subtraction and addition. I said, all right. And her mother said she can do all kinds of numbers and things. Well, she was, did all right with that. She's excited. She does it. And um, then she said, Mama wants me to read this little booklet, story. I've got to have this story, and then I'm going to write a little notes about it. She has like, like a little essay, but it's, you know, it's about 10 sentences, something like that. She did pretty good. She wrote it. She's done it in a minute. It's just, it's just like that, you know. She got, she got to move. I mean, she's got to move. Well, she says, I'm done. I said, you are? There's nothing else you're supposed to read. All, all the things you have. You have lots of things there in your bag. Well, no, it's all right. I don't have to do that. I said, no, all right. I said, you've got to be still. Papa has to go back and make some calls, call here to the secretary and set up some things, you know. And um, I wanted to type something. Well, that didn't last long. She said, now, Papa, it's time to go outside. I said, well, hold on a minute. I said, why don't you just go out there and swing a minute and let me do a few things. I can see you right there out the window. She says, all right. Well, she goes, swings a minute. She comes back to the steps, and she sits down, and she looks over there um, at that school. See, the school's right across the hill. See, she knows she's supposed to be in school. She wants to be in school, but she can't be there. Lynette, you'd just have to see it. You'd have to get a picture of this. If I had a video cam going, it would be the most wonderful thing. And she drops her head. I looked out the door. I said, she dropped her head down. It's like she became so sad, depressed, you know. The time, see, I'm talking about time now. Her time, she has her time. Just like all of us. I have my time. And Martha has her time. You have yours. Anyway, she waits out there a minute. And she knocks on the door. She said, Papa, let's play something. Well, it came to my mind. I said, i got a schedule. I'll go down and get the bat and ball. She thought it was an old bat and ball. Now watch what happens in the time schedule of life. You're doing your thing. I came around the back corner, and she's standing out there, and she's still moping around, you know, walking around, waiting for Papa. I popped open that little ball. It's a soft blue ball, and it's a pretty kind of a big bat. It's about that long. You know, bat and ball is what it is. It's like the resurrection of Jesus happened. She came alive, friends. I mean, you'd, you'd have to see that. You, you can't really gla- gra- uh, get a grasp of what happened in that little amount of time. That's the most wonderful time. She said, I've never seen such a beautiful bat. The blue is my favorite color. That ball feels so good. I mean, just it's on and on. It was just like the whole light came alive out of the time of darkness. And we played there a while, and she did well. But I was thinking about that relating to time. Her time and my time and other times, everything's different, you know, on schedule. But she has something made up in her mind. And um, dear Martha and Mary, back to the story. They had to wait, you see, wait upon the Lord. You tonight may face severe illness. We spoke with Jack. Uh, Jack is a very sick man. I just want you to know that. I've shared that a few times before. Uh, but anyway sometimes there's no answer for family friends, the church we just have to wait upon God walk with God Jesus knows when to act when the exact moment of time will be for us to bear the trial for us to stand up under that trial to help us to learn the most of the trial 
to bear the testimony of God's power and strength. Whenever the moment arrives, the Lord arises to meet the need of his child, his believer, his follower. Believers in Christ, we do what Martha and Mary had to do, just wait, wait, trusting the Lord. The Lord will act. We can't dictate to him when or how something will happen. We find ourselves confronted by disease, disappointment, delays, and even death. But our encouragement is a 2W formula. You ready for this? The 2W. Word of God, wait for God. Say that with me. Word of God, wait for God. And it'll help you. It'll help you. Live by faith, not by sight. Take heart. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 27, 14. Purpose number four, the death of Lazarus, was to teach the need to grasp the opportunity. Get that? The need to grasp the opportunity. Verses 7 through 10. It had been three days since Jesus received the word. Now it was time to go. As I told you, that fourth day was the day he would arrive. Disciples very upset, protesting. Let's not go to Judea. The religious leader is going to try to kill you. They already told you they would. Jesus gives that forceful answer in verses 9 and 10, only 12 hours in the day. We must go and do the Father's work. Do his will while it's time, it's day. Go do what's right regardless of the danger. I know about visiting one evening. I knocked on the door. And guess what I heard coming? Not man, but dogs. Wild dogs. They might have been tame for them, but they were wild to me. They hit that door. If I didn't have enough sense to know how to jam my hand against that door, they would have knocked me down. And I would have been done. You might not see me anymore without being a pastor. I'd better be in the graveyard somewhere. Go and do what's right. The day will pass. Opportunities lost. John 9 and 4. Jesus would not walk in the darkness. You know why Jesus don't walk in darkness? What the message is there? See, there's no darkness in him. He's the light of the world. He that follows after me shall not what? Walk in darkness. He's teaching his disciples, teaching us. While it's day, the night comes when no man can work. It means we don't have the opportunity. Grasp it while it's there. Not need to be stumbling about in the dark, foolish things, doing foolish deeds. Get into the business of the ministry of the gospel while we have time. While it's day. And that's why you carry the gospel. When all when you come here, you learn about the gospel. You go to home, you go to your neighborhood, uh, you go to school, you go to business. You carry the gospel. There's ways to do that. It's always might say, well, I can't pray before people. Well, bless God, you can bow your head and they don't know what you're doing. You can shoot, you can shoot one of those supersonic uh, prayers straight to heaven. That's what, remember, Adrian Rogers, the late Adrian Rogers said something about that. I thought that's pretty cool. You can look at him straight in the face, shoot a prayer straight to heaven. That's what Nehemiah did, you know, when he's over there before the king during Babylon. Yeah. God has a plan. Don't you give up. Brother Paul told the Roman Christians, knowing the time that now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night's far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Romans 13, 11, 12. Cast off. What are we all Christians going to do right here? This is April 2022. Cast off the darkness of foolishness. Put on the light of God's holy wisdom. Cast off busyness, running and racing here and there. And center your life on the business of the Lord. Focus on what you can do in ministry for the Lord. You don't need to be doing everything. 
God didn't call you to do everything. You choose certain things and let the Lord use you. If he can't use you, you stop it. Cast off the darkness of selfish pride. Put on the light of God's humility. I remember reading about Harry Truman, you know, took over the presidency. He was vice president under Franklin Roosevelt in that last term there in the wartime, World War II, the late time of war in the 40s. And Harry had to take over. And one of the senators came by and one day said, I want to give you some wise advice. Here's what he told him. He said, lots of people around you are going to tell you how great you are. But I want you to know you ain't. I guess that's a pretty good uh, message for Harry, for all of us. In the life of Christ's church, Don Page ain't great. Do you know that? He ain't. You've got to humble yourself and know there's only one great leader. We talked today, leader of the church. We believe that Jesus is Lord. No other. No other. Mm -mm. You go a long way in dealing with the Lord and His church. If you, if you walk that way, cast off the darkness of unbelief. Put on the light of belief, faith. Cast off the darkness of fear. Just like Mary and Martha there with Lazarus. Their sickness and death. They're their brother. We focus on this physical life so much. Put on the courage of Jesus who gives eternal life and eternal hope. Jesus said in John 12, 35, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. Fifth, Lazarus' death shows Jesus' great power over death, 11 through 14. Jesus, plain as dead, I'm going to awaken Lazarus out of sleep. Now, if I told you that in the morning I'm going to awaken my wife out of sleep, that is not what Jesus is talking about. I'm talking about raising her physically. Disciples misunderstood. They thought he was resting just like we would think. It's just normal. Jesus said, guys, Lazarus is dead. He's dead. Several truths. Jesus called Lazarus. Notice this. Verse 11. What are the two words he called him? He said of him, our friend, our, he's talking to his disciples. As Jesus loved, loved Lazarus, he loves every believer, and he calls us to be his friends. Wouldn't you like to be a friend of Jesus? Sure. This is a son of God. The other option is to be his enemy. That's, that's not good. That's bad. The friend to all fellow believers who are in true fellowship with him. Another thing important here, he predicted he would raise Lazarus from the dead. Verse 11, he said, awaken, rise him up, resurrect him. It's a picture of the resurrection. Disciples had misunderstood the meaning of death and resurrection. Very important. Death is like sleep. Jairus' daughter, Matthew 9, asleep. Stephen was martyred. It said, he has fallen asleep, Acts 7, 60. Some of the 500 witnesses who saw Jesus ascend, and then it says, they've fallen asleep, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Believers already in heaven are said to be asleep in Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Death is called sleep to help us picture the idea that a believer is resting in the presence and comfort of God. Resting from our labor of service here. Resting and refreshing Himself for greater servants for God. Many in the world picture death as annihilation. Just cease to exist. The Bible does not say that. Believers continue to exist. Our soul resting in life in the comfort of God. Absent from the body. Present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We're getting up and we're getting out. And be with the Lord. Body lays down, yes. You say to so to speak, it's sleeping. Not the soul of man. Not his spirit. 
Unbelievers, the unsaved, the lost, whatever you want to call those outside of Jesus, there's no rest. It's torment, darkness, fire, worms, hell in the end. Jesus shows his great power over death. And he's going to raise him up so all can see and believe that he is the resurrection and the life.